Welcome back uh, to Carla 2020 and to this content block entitled The Power of Film to Change the Narrative. 24 hours into the formal program of this conference, I'd, I'd uh, just to like to reaffirm our value statement. You can hear the full text in the opening session, which is of course available to see on the website. It is much longer, but it starts like this. We are committed to an intersectional framework in our fight for gender equality in all facets of life and work. We believe that Black Lives Matter. We believe that LGBTQIA rights are human rights. We will support and amplify the voices of artists that are undervalued, marginalized or suppressed by politics or other circumstances. Uh, in a program block this morning, my moderating colleague Victoria Thomas observed that when all voices in a hypothetical future, which I hope is really soon, when all voices and experiences really do have access to filmmaking, then of course our stories will automatically become intersectionally uh, aware. So what we're talking about in storytelling terms is a multiplicity of perspectives of different gazes. And in this next hour, we're going to talk specifically about challenges uh, to patriarchal and heteronormative structures. To start us off, I'm proud to welcome Skadi Loist, who is a visiting professor for production cultures in audiovisual media industries at uh, the Film University Babelsberg Konrad Wolf in Potsdam, and also principal investigator of the research project Film Circulation on the International Film Festival Network. Some of her recent work is focused on gender equality in the German film industry. You might want to hear more about that uh, already in the researcher talks on our website. And she's a co-founder of the Inter International Screen Industries Consortium, which is a network of screen industry researchers analyzing the position of women in screen industries across the globe. I hereby extend my warmest welcome to Scott Loist. Hello. Thank you very much for the invitation from WIFT International and Carla 2020. Thank you especially to Helene Granquist and Regina Most um, for their tireless efforts to bring this brilliant program together. It's a great honor to be part of this lineup and it's equally exciting and actually slightly intimidating. So um, let's get into this. Um, Helene and Regina asked me what I would be most interested and excited about in the Kala 2020 context. And I mentioned that along with my research interests in film festivals and gender equity and diversity in screen industries, I've long worked with queer film culture. So we talked about the joy of teaching a queer cinema class here at Film University Babelsberg this semester where I'm sitting right now, which happened all online due to the global COVID-19 pandemic. So despite the shortcomings of online teaching, much like the online conferencing that we face right now, I love the exchange with my co-teaching colleagues uh, who were Angelina Macarone, a German filmmaker with a brilliant oeuvre of lesbian and feminist films, and Susanne Feudel, who's an activist, our school's tireless gender equity officer and film editor as well as our interdisciplinary group of students studying directing, producing, editing, film heritage, creative technologies and media studies. So all different kinds of uh, degrees, um, plus they hail from different parts of the world and also um, zoomed in from Pakistan, for instance, um, and showed us their films and their cultural context. And it is this interdisciplinarity, the exchange from different vantage points of queer and film theory and filmmaking practice in different departments that I love there, as well as the open dialogue in a space where people would actively listen to each other. Um, and that is after all an essential part of film and media making, which is always a collective effort we should not forget. So this is exactly what I love about the approach of Kala 2020, that it brings together film and television professionals, as well as activists and academics like myself from different walks of life and different regions and, and industries. Um, but we all come together to discuss how to bring a change about in the industry and how to envision the different film and media cultures. So this kind of change in a larger production culture needs to happen on different levels. 
within the structures of the industry, so behind the camera, who gets to and does tell the stories, and also in terms of what we get to see on screen in representation and storytelling, so which narratives we see and how. So it's about perspectives and it's also about the gaze. The gaze is a key category in film theory. The seminal essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema by Laura Mulvey, um, which was published 1975, established the feminist critique of film and said that film is actually structured around the male gaze and uh, determines the narrative that is driven by a male protagonist and treating women only as spectacle. So this is more than four decades ago. And since then, uh, much has been published, uh, written about uh, in terms of the gaze and also about spectatorship. Storytelling uh, perspectives have changed and renditions of a female gaze, a black female gaze um, um, discussed by bell hooks or a transgender gaze discussed by Jack Halberstam or a queer gaze have been laid out in the discussions on films like Paris is Burning or Boys on Cry. Such films and their perspectives are always part of a larger cultural discussion. So in the wake of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, the new intersectional political project called Queer, uh, which wanted to go beyond gay and lesbian identity politics, also led to new ways of storytelling that went beyond the underground and had crossover success. And it also laid the groundwork for broader appeal television series that we know today and that we're also going to discuss. Um, film critic B. Ruby Rich coined the term new queer cinema in 1992 for a flock of films that back then, uh, quote, were breaking with all the humanist approaches and identity politics. These works are irreverent, energetic, alternatively minimalist and excessive, above all their full pleasure, end of quote. So what these films, um, including classics like Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning, Gus van Sant's Mala Noche, and Todd Haynes' Poison, Greg Araki's The Living End, Rose Trush's Go Fish, Cheryl Dunier's The Watermelon Woman, and Camille Pierce's Boys Don't Cry, all have in common is that they operated with the deaf different narrative, um, giving a different perspective, working on genre and the gaze. So instead of adhering to the mainstream narrative convention of problematizing identity and foregrounding just single issues, like for instance, in the genre of the coming out film, which essentially only revolves about the presumed difference and they need to come out as other, as gay or trans, to then be generously accepted by the majority uh, heteronormative society. New queer cinema films did not end with this coming out. Instead, they told stories that started after, with main characters who lived matter-of-factly in a queer world and told universal stories. So by this, um, they did change perception for queer audiences who saw stories projected on screen that were closer to their actual experience but they also offered every viewer a different perspective on the world, one that does not presume a standard white middle-class heterosexual um, monogamous life. So this means it matters which stories are told, but also how they are told, from what vantage point and who is the presumed audience. So told from an unapologetic point of view from, for, and about a queer or another community, and the from, for, and about is a slogan of queer film festival programming in the 1990s. These films were less interested in explaining certain positions uh, to a presumed homogenous majority or what television commissioning editors imagine to be their dull audience and fight for an inclusion that needs to be granted. Instead, they rightfully assumed and asserted their position as already being part of society. As the slogan went back then, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. So now as discussions around diversity and inclusion, as well as post-colonial politics might teach us, the ability to voice this claim to a position within society, within representation, within media production, and have this voice actually heard 
might already hinge on positions of privilege. So research on systemic structural sexism and racism shows that it isn't as easy as encouraging underrepresented filmmakers to just do it. So along with ambitious and determined storytellers like Mo Abudu and others who we heard from yesterday and today, who just do go for it um, and, and do a great job, there also needs to be a change of the industry culture. So this is true for the independent sector as well as a bigger budget filmmaking. One recent example, uh, which is taking this trajectory seriously for me, is uh, Celine Siama's Portrait of a Lady on Fire. For me, it was the best film of 19, uh, 2019, um, or at least it's an instant classic for queer feminist cinema. And you see how big a fan I am with the poster in the back of me. <laughs> it's a costume drama and lesbian romance set in 18th century Brittany where Marianne, a painter, is asked to befriend and secretly paint Eloise um, so that her painting can be sent to her future husband and the marriage to be sealed. It is essentially a film about the gays, looking relations and viewing positions, a film revisioning the traditionally male-coded gaze of art, painting and film. Siyama problematizes the gaze and the inherent power dynamics and erotic charge between a painter and her sitter. Eloise is not just an image, not just a portrait, but a subject looking and speaking back and becomes the first a lover and later a married mother asserting her own agency. And beyond this main storyline, we encounter a community of women who show support, share knowledge and solidarity also across class hierarchies. In a sideline narrative, when the maid is pregnant and seeks abortion, that's, that's another example of that. Portrait is also an interesting case as it connects queer feminist narrative and storytelling with a queer feminist approach to filmmaking and industry. Um, in block two, we also heard today that uh, Siama worked with an all-female crew and is a vocal member of Collective 5050 in France, where her longtime collaborator, ex-partner and main actress Adèle Henel has led overdue discussions on Me Too in France last year. Thus, here queer gaze for representations and structures behind the camera and on screen come together. So this is not the only interesting case recently. Um, there are lots of other examples ranging from indie debuts to major blockbuster. Um, since I'm in Germany, one example might be the film Futur 3 or in English, uh, No Hard Feelings, which premiered at Berlinale and won the Teddy Award this year, and which is a case of a young independent film collective uh, starting outside the established industry circles to tell an innovative queer story with a migrant reality. Or on the other spectrum and incidentally shooting its new installment right across the street from my office where I am right now at Studio Babelsberg would be The Matrix, which is currently discussed as an inherent queer narrative following an interview by Lily Wachowski a few weeks ago. So what they all share is an urge to tell stories differently with a queer gaze, and that's um, what I would hope to maybe discuss a bit more. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, that's uh, oh, that's so interesting, and <laughs> I wish we had an hour uh, just for this part. I guess I, the first thing I want to say. Um, is Portrait of a Lady on Fire did really well uh, also with all kinds of audiences, uh, even in the cinema. And I wonder if you think uh, that it spoke to these wide audiences in some way because of, of specifically how the medium of film places viewers with the perspective. It, 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 this, so, so there is this sort of normalizing position of, of what is this desire? We are trained on the male gaze and then it can be subverted almost. To, we can use that skill set to place ourselves in other positions. I think so. Unfortunately, I, I'm, my view hasn't been that it's been doing that well, because in, in that same mm -hmm. year, like lots of other films got awards and this film was passed by. And I'm wondering on the opposite, whether that is exactly 
due to the way it is made and the way it's telling the story. So maybe I'm a bit negative, <laughs> but um, I think that is very interesting that, for instance, we, we have a European, uh, European University Film Award where from 24 countries, students watch five films that are entered for the European uh, Film Awards. And Portrait was part of that and everybody loved it and it won the award, uh, thankfully. Um, but the, the French student, for instance, uh, explained that the discussions in France were a lot different. And I wonder whether that has to do with the way it's also part of larger political discussions. Um, mm. But on the other hand, like you say, I, I think that when you are interested in cinema and cinematic language, this is the perfect film to bring in that discussion about the gays and and on the way problematizing but in a playful way that you you watch the those painting scenes and you're just wowed by the images and at the same time realize the way it's told very differently in in narrative but also in the way the camera works and and the aesthetics work i i'm thinking a little bit i mean in some ways this this journey uh, of of taking place and and creating voices uh for people in in film who haven't historically had that i mean just including uh, including cis women uh, is also about the process of of somehow exercising uh, those things that 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 uh, we've internalized or decolonizing uh, in some ways cinema and i wonder from that perspective of course queering one's gaze would benefit everybody we're challenging normative systems which are making everybody miserable except for the people at the very top possibly I and mean, probably not even then uh, so but at the same time like i'm very wary about expanding this term beyond people with specific experiences uh, do you have a reflection on that yeah, I feel like that is um, that might be similar to a in discussion I had with myself when preparing this talk about representation, right? Like saying on the one hand, um, who is allowed, or you know, discussions about who is doing representation uh, and what terms. And on the one hand, as you've seen, I argue for a certain type of representation by a certain group of people who, who have experience with that and, and are in a position to bring that about. At the same time, I'm afraid of essentialism like that, right? Like who, what does that mean? Like it shouldn't only be, be women to create a female gaze, whatever that actually is, or it shouldn't only be um, black or of color filmmakers who to, who who tell stories with only black and of color characters, right? So so that is, I think, yeah. a, a position that that might be um, where it becomes more complex to argue for a diversity behind the screen and an on screen um, without uh, pigeonholing people again. And in and the, the principles uh, are very sound, but in, they, they collide against reality, of course, because we really? go on such journeys with our yeah. identities, our genders, yeah. uh, certainly our sexualities, and 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 also in in some cases with cultural belonging, and uh, because of migration and finding out about your family histories or things like this as well. So, so it's very difficult to lock down. I'm, this, of course, makes me think of of Joey Soloway, who, who we'll speak to in in a few moments. Uh, I, I I mean, I'm guessing, of course, you're familiar with their work. I wonder whether there's anything you'd like to say about Joey Soloway now that you know they're listening? Um, sure, I'm, I'm very um, interested to later hear more about Transparent, obviously, because I think when it started in 2014, it was really groundbreaking in trying to change the trans narrative and the transition narrative and have an older mm -hmm. character and I think it's also super interesting to have the different supporting storylines with other trans women who then become friends with the main character Mora, and but also the the, the sidelines with the, with her daughter Sarah and her the, the, the way she explores different mm -hmm. kinds of sexuality that are fluid. Um, and another very interesting bit is of course how trans inclusion was uh, actually navigated in the production mm -hmm. process. I mean, we all know the discussions about, around Jeffrey Tambor as a cis actor, 
but also at the same time, including trans talents like Chris Ernst, who created the mm. artfully crafted, multi-layered, historical, essayistic, brilliant title sequences for the different mm. seasons. So I feel like there, there are a lot of uh, different layers that are super interesting about it. And that too seems uh, like a journey that both I would expect from the artistic perspective, but also we as, as an audience and as, a, as an audience learning about the issues in many ways for people who are not uh, directly affected that that we have done, gone on this together at this very interesting historical moment. Well, I think we should move on to that. Scott, thank you so much uh, you. for this introduction. And we're going to reconnect to these themes uh, along the next uh, few days. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. So our next guest um, is the creator, writer, executive producer, and director of Transparent, as well as a bunch uh, of those same titles on the TV series adaptation of Chris Cross's I Love Dick. There are multiple uh, Emmy Award winning writer and director, a co-founder of the 5050 by 2020 network and of the intersectional production company Topol, as in Topol the patriarchy, um, as well as an artist of cinema. They are a playwright, a memoirist, a comedian, an activist, in my view, an increasingly influential film, film theorist. It is my great honor to welcome Joey Soloway. Hi. Let's see if you're muted still. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we are. Hey, how's it going? Hi. Hey. Really, really well. In fact, there's a joke that you should never ask a Nordic person, a person from Nordic countries, speaking English, how they are, because we always take this question literally and want to give a real answer. Um, that said, I will now ask you, ask you the same. And, and I think uh, given the kind of year we've all been having, yeah. um, especially perhaps given the kind of year the United States are having, I, I like to ask you very earnestly, how are you? I'm actually doing quite well considering um, I think my heart is really torn apart by all of the people who have lost jobs and lost homes and um, are really unstable right now in this kind of like global uprising and pandemic, but it really is the uprising that gives me hope. I mean, the, the conversations that are happening around intersectionality and you know, how white supremacy and patriarchy uh, mirror the, the way they work, I think has really like launched a way of talking about everything I want to talk about that I never thought would really happen in my lifetime. So it's really painful and it's also really exciting. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk more about uh, all of those things. Um, but I think I, I gotta say that there in that, that uh, there, there's a, there was a moment, uh, I think, in the in connection to uh, the election of your current president, uh, where you very publicly uh, spoke very clearly about what happened in that moment. I think you said, I have a quote here that says, I lost my shame. There is a monster in the White House. I'm going to be a monster. I want little girls to dream about being monstrous. Not in the same way, but about justice, gay rights, trans rights, intersectionality. Uh, have you become a monster since? Yeah, you know, I, I something about not wanting to center whiteness has made me sort of have to consider what it means to be a monster. I think as a person who's queer and who's non-binary, I do want to yell all the time. And at the same time, I think the reckoning around race has made me recognize um, the need for centering black voices. So yeah, I definitely have that kind of part of me that wants to just go like, fuck everybody and fuck patriarchy. But I have to recognize how I benefit from white supremacy. And um, I think anything that I want to say about men not being able to understand women can be equally understood about white people not understanding black people. And so I just want to be really, really careful um, about having that permission to be loud and wild and crazy that I felt that I needed so much. I need to kind of like mix that in with making sure that um, I'm not um, taking the place of a person of color who actually needs that moment to speak. Yeah, I, I have to, I, in an intersectional context, it's a difficult thing to say, but I, I feel like I do, uh, even as a relatively straight white cis woman, I have to personally also thank you for your work. I mean, obviously, it's not like I've been structurally underrepresented on screen before, uh, 
even so quite a lot of facets even even of my life had just not been portrayed and and i i think that your work was incredibly groundbreaking for me i think in particular this idea of the powerful female intellectual who is also um i think the technical term is a massive slut <laughs> uh, I, I wish we had better language for this but i guess female desire is still uh, unnameable largely yeah. and and you have been a great uh, champion for for us so thank you very much uh, for this yeah. thank you, so uh, much. you talked somewhere uh, about this taboo around female desire uh, having profound implications on, on the artistic careers of people who are not women could you elaborate on that yeah i mean profound you know sometimes uh, i'll get in these conversations with people where they'll say like what are the barriers to entry for a woman in the world of filmmaking you know is it um, working hours or is it you know um mentorship programs and they'll polite politely want me to come up with one or two or three like fixes and um this is one of those times where i have to just like control the monster because i just like want it all to come out of me like an ocean when we live in patriarchy every single thing that is uttered by somebody who's not a man is suspect because of the way that it stops the male gaze from seeing. So even saying, I don't wanna be an object, I wanna be a subject. Even just saying that once on a Tuesday at 10 uh, is incredibly threatening to a giant, giant pool of humans who control our world. I don't wanna be an object, I wanna be a subject. You know, that makes men feel like, wait, what? I don't, I don't objectify you, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's like, no, you objectify us by thinking of the male as the kind of er, as the a, as the mm. um, human, as the default. And by saying that woman or that person of color or that she's hot, like the way that men move through the world insists that everything is theirs. And so as we begin to do little things like say, I don't want to be the subject. I don't want to be the object. I want to be the subject. It's dangerous. And then when we say, I want to, you know, pick up the camera and I want to film things, now it's even more dangerous. And that's just one day of saying it one time. But as filmmakers, we have to say over and over and over again, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see. And then we're asked what we want to see. And by stating I want, we're saying I have desire. And so it complicates our subjectivity for men because then as they, they become the object and they naturally are just aggressively, unconsciously going to be saying, I don't like that film. I don't like that book. I don't like that TV show. I don't like that character. Uh, she's loud. She's bossy. I, all of these things that I was told where I had so much shame about everything I was writing, you know, I'd say pre Lena Dunham, pre Andrea Arnold, I was writing into this void going, I can't see myself. I can't feel myself. I don't know how the camera works. All I see on television and movies is this shame about I'm not, I'm not enough. I'm not hot enough. I'm not cute enough. I'm not thin enough. You know, women are expected to walk on this tightrope, you know, of desiring, but not desiring too much, being attractive, but not being too attractive. We don't even have a place to stand. I mean, we're not even safe to be able to say I wanted to have sex. If we say it, it means I consent to being raped. There is no safe in between place for a woman to stand and even say, I want to have sex. So imagine saying, I want to be a filmmaker and I want to make films and I want to watch people have sex on film. And I want the wall to look this way and I want the light to look like that's 10 I wants I just said and every single one of those is incredibly upsetting to just a man's ability to live. So it's not working hours, it's not the fucking programs, it's patriarchy. I'm, I'm going to cry. I mean, even I realized as you said that there was a moment in my life. I don't know why I'm being personal. I'm being very personal. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop being personal. There was a moment a few years ago in my life. I was standing at some kind of fancy dress party dressed as a tarot card with a giant, giant, like a meter high star on my head. And it was like four in the morning. I was standing with a cocktail in my hand saying, I'm done diminishing myself. And somebody looked at my star and said, I can see that. And I, I've thought about this later, like it's funny. It's a funny moment, right? It's a funny story. But now I think it's not a funny story. I was probably like 40 years old. And I had, I just had arrived at a point where I'm able to say I'm done diminishing myself. I had no idea. To, like, that is not even an I want sentence. You know, I'm not even like at the first song of a Disney character. I have no idea what I want to achieve yet, you know? <laughs> and, and that's, 
And that was my big moment of liberation. That's super depressing, you know. It's really depressing. It's incredibly depressing. Especially because I believe that the more people like us who start to say I am and, you know, remove that, you know, the patri the, the male gaze is a tool of patriarchy. I always say, uh, pro you know, um, protagonism is propaganda for, for, for privilege. So every guy who's making a show or a movie, he is creating propaganda for his privilege and his way of seeing. And so, you know, I can draw a direct line to Trump, direct, direct line to fascism, direct line to every man who believes that, you know, um, the world belongs to him, that he should be a king. So every time, you know, you pick up a camera, or I pick up a camera, or anybody picks up a camera, and then you start to add in people of color and queer people and people with disabilities and sex workers and everybody who would be otherized by the male gaze, every second we pick up the camera and say, I am, I want, you know, we're destroying patriarchy. Um, and we're destroying so, war, you know, it, all, it, feels, yeah. it feels really huge and simple to me. We're destroying war. We're standing up for love. We're standing up for tolerance by saying, you know, your ability to other eyes, anyone ends today. It's my camera. So when you verbalized, verbalized your own artistic process before, um, you've offered us an alternative to this male gaze, your own take on a female gaze, which I understand, uh, as I understand it, involves, let's say, three things, making the film using uh, the physicality of emotion, um, using the camera to show what it feels like to be watched, uh, or seen, but I think watched, maybe actively watched, uh, and, and also then transitioning from subject to, uh, to uh, or from object to subject and, and returning that case. This feels yeah. very top level. Could you expand on it, please? Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was asked to speak at the Toronto Film Festival and, you know, sort of che cheekily was like, nobody's really claimed the female gaze yet. I'm going to go grab that, you know, because the male gaze, you know, we're also clear um, on what the male gaze is. And so, you know, I, I just want to say that, like, I don't really know what the female gaze is. I made an attempt to define it. Those were just the first three things that came to mind. Um, but, you know, as somebody who identifies as non-binary now, even the female gaze is suspect. Um, but, so, but just to let you know how I got there, <clears throat> as I was coming up in Hollywood, <clears throat> working on Six Feet Under and then working on United States of Terror with Diablo Cody, we started to ask ourselves, these questions around the hero's journey and the male gaze. And the questions were, what is the heroine's journey and what is the female gaze? And I started to sort of ask a lot of female writers if they thought there was such thing, a, such a thing as a heroine's journey, distinct and different from the hero's journey. And of course, like I respect the hero's journey. We understand that, you know, by hitting the marks of the hero's journey, we can capture the attention of an audience. You know, an audience wants to know five minutes in what to care about. So uh, this isn't instead of the hero's journey, this is just atop the hero's journey. But what a lot of women said, different women from different places, different writers said, you know, it's in the shape of a spring. The heroine's journey is in the shape of, a, of an egg. The heroine's journey is round. So I started to feel like the heroine's journey was about going in circles, recognizing those circles and creating a journey out of the, you know, ambulating by iterating. So it could kind of be like the moon getting wider in the middle and then smaller at the top. But it's this structure that allows us to not have shame about the feeling that, we're, that we come back again to the same place. So I think it's like this misogynist, misogynist idea. She goes in circles. I can't understand her, she goes in circles. Me, I'm a man, I, I, I'm an arc. So we reclaim the circles and we say, you know, I move forward by not going in a circle, but by moving in a circle so that every time I return to what you call the same place, it's actually my vantage point. I can see. I was there and I'm going there and I can see because I'm in the same place I've returned. So we take that kind of holy energy of the circle and we use it to ambulate forward in our story and in the center of that circle is what I consider the magic of storytelling from a non-male gaze. And so, so isn't actually, yeah, sorry, just, I, I mean, I may misremember, but isn't kind of the end of the hero's journey that the heroes come home, comes, comes to the beginning yeah, and now they've changed. So yeah. that's kind of the beginning of the, you know, recognizing now I have changed, I have learned, and then you just do yeah. that over and over. So do, doesn't that make you more of a hero on the heroine's journey? Just saying. Yeah, I mean, for sure. You, you, get, you have like four, you know, as many times as you can, you know, ring the bell of, of recognizing something. But it's sort of like I, I find that these stories take into account not just what you want, but um, 
how what you want affects others. So, I mean, I, I, again, I'm like a total amateur philosopher here, but I think about um, the movie Margaret, even though it was made by Kenny Lonergan, is a great example of this kind of heroine's journey where the protagonist, you know, um, starts off causing a death really just by being. She's so cute that a bus driver looks at her and he accidentally hits an older woman. She's got her new cowboy hat, she puts it on, bus driver looks at her, boom, he gets in an accident. This is a beautiful example of a hero. Of a, a, heroine's journey story, a female gay story, because, you know, she is dealing with that question of what it means to, you know, she's seeing the seer, right? She's seeing the bus driver who saw her. And now she's starting to ask the question of, did she kill this, this older woman's, you know, did she murder her by putting her cap on? So this is like divided feminine. It's this great story. But as you sort of follow her, you, you don't follow her going after something. You follow her moving in circles, kind of trying to put herself on trial to figure out what her power is. And that just feels like quintessentially female, you know, that, that the ways in which we search and search and sometimes search inward to understand the meaning of our movements rather than go get something. So I, I guess I find that like my stories are, are women going to get something, but what they're going to get is, is meaning. And so the, this circle thing, you know, Judy Chicago call, calls it the circle based pedagogy. So I just kind of pedagogy. So I just like bring this idea of this sphere with me everywhere. I'm holding it in my belly on the set. I'm holding it around the entire, you know, the, the whole cast is standing in a and crew. We all stand in a circle before we start our day to hold space for um, the gratitude that we get to spend our day playing and spend our day making art. You know, we're actively de, you know, activating patriarchy, power, money, schedule by stopping before we start and saying, <sighs> we have all the time in the world. There's also something so powerful about that being like, because in a way, that's also what the heroine's journey then says. It's like, oh no, I already have what I need. I just yeah. need to, I just need to stop believing the people who say that I don't. Right? Yes. We in this circle, we have what we need to to make film today on this set. Yes. As you know, if we remember to breathe and, and remember, right? Yes, and remember to respect one another and to love one another. We say things like, we don't throw anybody under the bus. We don't talk behind each other's backs. We sort of just throw this kind of hippy dippy idea of love and gratitude into the center of a machine that usually runs on numbers. We're running out of time, we're running out of money. Like, and then there's some men and they're standing there with their arms folded and then there's like a male director and everybody on the set is trying to make sure he's happy. The executives, the actors, the crew. So I just come to the set with this like open belly of like, holy shit, I'm surfing on people acting out my psychological questions with lines that I wrote and wardrobe. I mean, it's effing heaven. No wonder men don't want women to do it. Like no wonder they don't make it easy for women to do it. You know, filmmaking is this three-dimensional art where you're living in the emotions. It's, it's this, you're painting with feeling. It's the funnest thing. Um, that's why men aren't stepping down right now and going, we need to share this. It's like, it's a great honor to live in a living version of your ideas. So I just come there with this very open, I just reverse everything that would normally be filmmaking. Prioritize background artists, bring them into the center, tell them they're not gonna get in trouble, offer them the chance to act. Say, you know, here's what you're doing as a background, background artist. Go to your risk space, have fun. We're making a living painting. Yeah, I know you're just the person sitting at the table in the strip club on another movie. But in this movie, what, you, what are you doing at the strip club? And what are you doing tonight? Use the, the camera's not on you, it's on the whole room. So use this to further your craft as an actor. And then just by offering the people who are normally shamed, kept in over there, you're not allowed to eat the food, don't make a mistake. By offering those people central, you know, power, everything just starts to change. You know, the, the energy changes and we're just having fun all day. 
Um, there is this very solid management theory about leading creatives where like if you have people who are operating on a very high skill level, which obviously you would on, on your sets, you kind of like being their boss is about enabling them to work. Mm -hmm. Like it's about not getting in, about creating the frame and, and, and like supporting them rather than being the decider. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I, we have all gone through this reckoning and in this industry, of course, particularly uh, in the last few years. And that is not how sets historically were. Uh, we're organized, and I guess I'm going to have to uh, address that a little bit because you, one of your sets also got got caught um, into this, into this reckoning. And other things, of course, also I realize you've you've replaced Brian Singer on a on a project, for instance. Could you talk a little bit to, about what your thoughts are today? You know that, that we are a while away from the first storm of of Me Too. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, again, what's happening right now r around white supremacy and patriarchy being dis dismantled, I think like, none of us could have ever imagined. You know, we just didn't think we were going to see it in our lifetime. Harvey Weinstein in jail. You know, as a Hollywood person, you could have said, you know, it, a year from now, Har Harvey Weinstein's going to be in jail. And I would have been like, for what? <laughs> you know, I knew he was like, you know, but it just wasn't possible for us to believe that all of the people who held, held all of the power were going to be questioned yeah. about whether or not they were ethical. And so in, you know, kind of thinking about what happened with Jeffrey, who um, was part of our beloved community. Um, yeah, we had our, 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 our circle, we had our love, but there's, you know, this other thing in Hollywood called number one on the call sheet and whoever is the lead on the show, is number one. Yeah, people are numbered. Number one, number two, number three. And literally numbered. Literally, yeah. On the call sheet. <laughs> but then the ADs refer to them as number one, number two, number three. <clears throat> so here's somebody who's number one on the call sheet, who's been in the in the TV business for however many years, 40 years, longer than any of us. So has more experience than any of us. Can't make the show without this person. You know, if he's not happy, the show is not happening. And I've worked on a lot of shows and it's like, that's how it goes. Number one gets whatever they want. And even though I said, you know, so-and-so is not coming, the director's not coming, you know, there's no, there's no, um, you know, executives coming to say we're in trouble. There's like this kind of emotional awareness that number one has to be happy. And I think we were all, I think, so hoping that our revolution was real, that just like certain things that were right in front of us, we didn't see. We just didn't see. And you kind of look back and you realize that like our, you know, our transformative action program where we brought in as many trans people as possible and tried to sort of have the show have a trans gaze. Um, I kind of realized like, why didn't it occur to me earlier that that system would come into a confrontation with somebody who was raised as a star in the patriarchal system, believing the world revolved around him. Also in an earlier generation, it's not an excuse, but those norms of course, historically were even, even stronger. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I really do feel for men. I really do feel for men right now because they literally don't get it. That, um, you know, I think a lot of men in, I'll do my imitation for you, but a lot of men in Hollywood and elsewhere, I'm sure you guys have men like this too, move through the world like, um, oh, hello. Oh, well, look at you. Aren't you wonderful? You belong to me and this thing belongs to me. And oh, I like your lipstick. What are you wearing? Stand back. Like they move through the world believing that we're, everything's on a platter for them because they were told that's what it means to be a man, to center yourself and to weigh in and to admire and to be sexual and to flirt and to touch, you know, all kinds of men that I know and love I just would touch me throughout my whole life. And I was just like, well, this is fun, right? Cause this is how it is to be with men. You have to just kind of let them have access to you. Like, again, it didn't even occur to us. It was the water around us that powerful men have access to everything. So I really do feel for them because it's all over. They just can't do it anymore. Yeah, and, but I think you said a really important like keyword earlier because you said we, we didn't ask ourselves whether or not they were ethical. 
And that's actually a really good distinction because that's what this has moved on to. And then people are saying, oh, this has gone too far and so on. Right. Yeah, because like no, not every person who gets caught up in this is a, is a sexual predator in the sense that they have like a, like a groomy, a salty pattern, you know, yeah. over decades. That isn't always it. Sometimes, unfortunately, like way too often that is also but, it. But the groomy but it's like, pattern that you just talked about, yeah. that's also life. That's oh, you for sure. Life. It's like that when I realize yeah. when I think about my my teens and my twenties, like okay, maybe not the word groomy is salty, but certainly men over time, slowly but surely, trying to get me to have sex with them, mm -hmm. trying yeah. to get me to question my reality to figure out whether or not I had any desire, and then is salty. What does a salty mean? That somebody pushes forward when you you know when they're not sure if if the yes or a no. You know, yeah, and, that, and that's why I like the word ethical here, because it's it's like it's not, you know, a lot of these guys, even, you know, including like guys that we love, you know, who don't get it. Like what they don't get is that the measure is not are you a rapist, the measure are you ethical? And the answer is like, mm, kind of we're all living in a system that is not ethical. So so probably we're not being ethical and we're trying to change it. And it's it hurts everybody in particular. It hurts the people who have benefited before. Yes. Um, but but I, and I think mm -hmm, I'm hanging on to this now, thank you, because you have given me a tool to communicate to guys who, who were not winners in the old system and who haven't been able to see themselves, you know, who may also be allies who like, who really feel challenged by this idea. They feel like they're being painted as predators and that isn't it. We are, we are revealing the unethical nature of like capitalist patriarchy. Oh, That's what we're talking yeah. about. It's, yeah. like, it's, like the it's really dangerous to be a cis man in patriarchy because honestly, you kind of don't know if people are consenting to anything. And if you're right. a white man in patriarchy and white supremacy, it's you have to be so careful because people are going to do things they don't want to do for your access, for your approval, for your money, for your jobs that you can give them. It's like, wake up, guys and white people. Like, people, everybody doesn't love you. You know, white people are going through the same reckoning with black people. It's like, oh, you mean when you came into, you know, when you were in the writer's room and you were acting like everything I said was funny, like you didn't really mean that? It's like, no, you were my boss and I want my job. You know, so, this is a huge awakening. <laughs> so we're going to have some audience questions soon. And if you're watching and you'd like to ask Joe an audience uh, question, you can uh, write it in the YouTube chat. And some of them are being magicked over, possibly all of them, I don't know, are being magicked over to me here. We already have some. We won't be able to answer all of them. I do apologize. Uh, but while you're doing that, uh, I'd just like to ask uh, maybe my final question, which is uh, our future is terrifying. Like, um, I was saying this morning that this is our practice pandemic. This is the one where our kids don't die. Mm -hmm. And and the series of crises that will follow up on each other, you know, in our lifetime. You know, and we're looking at, you know, your weather in California. Like this is, it's it feels like this is only going to get worse while we are trying to carve out like progress and fighting to save civilization and, you know, our species potentially. Uh, so... So it's going to be so hard, and it is hard, and you are a role model and an activist and an artist, and you're learning in public. How do we, how, how do you not burn out? How can you find joy? How can we learn that from you? Because I think we're going to all need to be that in our own lives. Yeah, well, I like, I, I do these kinds of kinds of visualizations, you know, because I think as I said, Harvey Weinstein being in jail was unthinkable and, you know, Trump in the White House was unthinkable. But I kind of, you know, have this, you know, we're, we're this far away from Biden getting elected, dying, and having a Black female president on the most powerful country on the planet. A, a Black female leader in the most powerful country. We're, 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 it, we're an eyelash away from that. And so when I imagine her presidency, whether it's, you know, before January or whenever it is, when I imagine her White House, you know, I imagine that I'll see you there at a party. And you'll say, remember that, you know, that, that Zoom we did? And I'll say, it was so amazing. And can you believe we're here? Look at this. It's like, it's a queer feminist White House and she's changing the world. And we're, and we're taking, you know, I imagine the best. And I even imagine, you know, and there's a prison and it's, you know, if I leave the party and go to visit the prison and, you know, Bannon's in there and Trump and they're all down there in the prison. <laughs> and they're just like, 
you know, in their underwear and I'm bringing them food, like, would I be nice to them? This is like a dungeon under yeah, the White dungeon. House. That's where we're keeping right. them now. Yeah. They're all down there, you know, and somebody has, <laughs> hey, I'm going to bring the food down to the prisoners. And I go, oh, I'll come with. It's like, and I, I really imagine going down there and seeing, you know, Trump and Steve Bannon and seeing, you know, all these people I despise and asking myself, like, would I, you know, would I just shove the food under your cell door? Or would I talk to you? Like, I try to have mercy. I go so far to try to have mercy for these criminals. In your um, imagination. Yeah, in my imagination. That's how I stay positive. I'm like, it's all coming. This, this, this revolution is all coming that people have been saying can happen. You know, we, we have to save the earth. And when you and I have this little conversation about like, holy shit, I wore a hat to a party. I was just gathering enough strength to feel like, a regular man feels every single day when he walks. <laughs> yeah. It's so obvious and so simple. And it's really about fascism, which is that power is about otherizing. And when you imagine just to kind of reverse, you know, and say that, um, you know, I'm always talking about this idea of the second coming isn't a person, it's an idea. The idea is, is love. The idea is tolerance. God is love. God is tolerance. I see this idea just being like one of those things that a whole planet could fall in love with in a yeah. moment that God is love. Yeah. God is Jesus and God is Moses and God, but actually what all the religions realize is it's love, which is tolerance, which is allowing people to be without having to live under the threat of fascism and yeah. white supremacy and patriarchy. And we're all ready. You know, we, we have the language, we have the tools, we have the internet. We're all ready. So, so in that case, I have an uh, audience question about that. Do you think okay. Hollywood is, the, I have an audience question about that specific thing. Okay. Is Hollywood ready? Can Hollywood rise to this moment, learn from these uprisings, figure out how to make systemic change? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not going to be given. It's going to be, it's going to be taken. And I read something yesterday, this is about race, but the same thing happens about gender. You know, I read somebody who said like, it takes a, oh, this was about theater companies needing to change their leadership. Somebody said, it takes a really amazing person to just step aside. You know, somebody's gonna be at the height of their career. They're gonna be a museum director. They're gonna run a theater company. They're, they're gonna run a studio. Their dreams are coming true. They have more money than they've ever thought they have. They have to step aside and say, I wanna replace myself with a black woman. I want, I want to find a, tran a, a black trans woman to put in power here because I know that by lifting up black trans women, if, if black trans women are leading, that means the rest of the world is okay. It means that the least powerful have made it to the top. So it's just a matter of just that opposite. It's like, don't look for the most powerful person. Don't look for the white guy. Don't look for the man. Don't look for the most experienced person. Look for the person who's ready to come in and share their leadership, share their vision, share their heart. There are so many people ready to do that. So um, I look at Hollywood, I look at all of the, everything. And I just think, you know, yeah, 10 years from now, all those people who are in power, they will be gone and all of our friends will have their jobs. What worries me though about that, and I think is that, I mean, looking at, for instance, in fighting with, between all the different feminisms, in particular, the, the generations and this like, absurdity that is feminism or like any kind of women's movement in particular that wouldn't include trans women. Like, I don't, I can't even square that equation. Like, I can't make that sentence work, but... We know they exist. And I understand that this, like many other like exclusive aspects of progressive movements have to come from fear. Like it's about people who've just only just achieved something and they see, they, they feel that the guys, you know, are not gonna step down. That if any solidarity is gonna be here, it's gonna be from whatever they've carved out for, for themselves. And I think, you know, the, that carving out like, yes, everybody should do some of this stepping aside. Uh, yeah. But what do you say to that? People? fear like because I feel I, I have a lot of sympathy for it even when I don't agree well I what? mean even if it makes me even if it gives me rage I kind of I, I have no sympathy for it but I understand it intellectually I can understand that there's a fear well I mean the, the infighting is natural it's you know it's completely natural in patriarchy and white supremacy it's like as, as soon as people start to talk about patriarchy and, white, and white, patriarchy and white supremacy and see it everywhere as the water you realize like you know when you say why is there this infighting it's like at, you know, imagine going to a concentration camp and wondering why different, you know, Jews were, you know, accessing privilege by turning on each other. It's like, this is apartheid. You know, mm -hmm. black people are, are going to be able to have power by 
respectability politics, which means turning on certain other black people. Women are able to have power by turning on other women. Women get power from patriarchy by saying, yeah, yeah, she's a slut. Women get power from patriarchy by going, I'm a mother, I'm a natural mother. The divided feminine, you know, the wife or the other woman, these are ways that women get power from patriarchy by presenting very strongly as only one. So you can have a man do anything for you if you're his mistress and you don't want anything else. Or you can have a man do anything for you if you're his wife and you don't want anything else. But as soon as you start to say, I am not a part of a woman, I am many women, you know, you become very threatening to your own access to money, to power, to your husband, to, to, to patriarchal privilege. So of course we're gonna turn on each other. Like we don't even recognize why we turn on each other yet, but of course we're going to. It's not anybody's fault. Yeah, I mean, now we're in 2020. So of course we're gonna have, like this is the perfect context to mention 50-50 by 2020. What's next? Where are, are we? Where are we with that? Well, you know, 50-50 by 2020 became a sort of what, what's called a floating signifier. So mm -hmm, I realized yeah. I was in those times up rooms that we were saying 50, 50 by 2020 and people were doing it at Cannes on the red carpet. And, and actually if you Googled 50, 50 by 2020, like a lot of people were calling things 50, 50 by 2020, but it sort of became this part of um, times up that I found myself somewhat responsible for. It needs to be about pledges, which is what is really the best use of it. And people did start to offer, you know, UTA and CAA, they started to say, you know, our goal is 50-50 by 2020. It sounded good. 50-50 sounds like balance. 2020 sounds like perfect vision. When mm -hmm. people start to ask the questions of like, well, what do you mean by 50-50? Do you mean cis women? Do you mean black women? You can just be like, oh, it's a, it sounds good. 50-50 by 2020. Just mm -hmm. enjoy it. <laughs> but I found for myself that the work I was doing there was always gravitating back to, towards mentoring and trying to bring people up into the industry pipeline, um, you know, artists fellowships. And so I think now that it's 2020, 50, 50 by 2020 is going to go back to times up and really be a way to measure people's coming through on their pledges. And I'm going to be looking more towards figuring out how to um, just pull people in, you know, find, find their artists, find the writers, find the leaders and, and pull them into the business. And I guess also we also all have a job, an accountability job for this counting, like just because there's a pandemic, just because all these things are happening in the industry is not like people in this, you know, the only people who, who all still have jobs are in this very powerful organization and they can be held accountable for things they have already promised to do. Yeah. Um, another question from a viewer is, if you should give a takeaway uh, to a young filmmaker, what would you say? I had a great teacher named Joan Shuckle and she told me that um, like a coal miner, a hazard of the job is like that you're gonna get toxins in your lungs. If you're an artist, a writer, a filmmaker, the hazard of the job is shame. You're gonna huh. feel shame all the time. And I still do. That feeling of like, I shouldn't do it. I don't wanna do it. I can't do it. I suck. Nobody wants it. Nobody likes me. It's never gonna go anywhere. So I would say I would tell any filmmaker to just really get familiar with that voice and recognize it. I tell people like recognize it as like the uninvited guest at the party who always shows up early holding a cheese wheel. You know, you're still getting ready for your party and the, and the person you really didn't want to come but you invited comes and sits in your living room while you're getting dressed, you know, waiting for the party to start. That's your shame. That's your voice of self-hatred. The voice of self-hatred comes from growing up in patriarchy and white supremacy if you're a person of color. And so you just have to fight against it. Just get it out, get it away from you and just, you know, make things, make things with your camera, make things at your friend's house, you know, start editing them, start entering contests. It's like, you need to be able to see what your gaze is. You need to be open enough to take in feedback, but not so open that it ever stops you from moving forward. We have like two more minutes. So I, I'm going to have to ask, since you're mentioning making, what can you talk about that you're working on right now? Okay, what are we working on? Um, I'm working on a pilot for Amazon that I guess I can't announce yet because it's not official, so I won't say what the project is. I'm writing the book for a, mu a theatrical musical with my sister of the transparent story. It's called A Transparent Musical, and that's going to be at ART Theater in Boston. And then I'm really kind of moving into this world of being a feature director and learning about what it means to kind of 
wait for one of these scripts to be ready. So there's Red Sonia, which is my superhero movie. There's Mother Trucker, which is Julianne Moore based on Amy Butcher's book about a writer who goes to Alaska to meet an ice, a female ice road trucker named Joy. There are a couple of other projects where just kind of I'm learning about that moment, you know, when a producer says green light, let's go. And in the meantime, there's just like multiple drafts. I'm reading drafts, I'm giving notes and just waiting for the script to be ready to shoot. That's fantastic. So will Red Sonia follow a heroine's journey? Oh yeah. Structure. Oh yeah. That's I mean, pretty I, exciting. It's amazing. She's the whole, the whole thing, the whole, the, the plot, the story, her, what she's doing. It's really like me being able to tell my same stories, but on a, a giant epic mythical scale. Also with swords. With swords and horses. <laughs> I can't wait. Thank you so much, Joey, for taking so this time. It's been amazing. Thank I'm you so, so much. And so uh, stay safe. And the great you. outcomes uh, for, for, for great political outcomes as well as great personal outcomes we all wish for you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. All right, dear friends, that is this session drawing to an end. And I would just like uh, now to remind you about our on-demand content. If you go to carla2020.se and look at this, uh, this session under program, you can find link to a great conversation between Tigmilan and Alexander Gray about the trans gaze, as well as activist talks on how queer voices can change the narrative by senior editor Theo Lindbergh and writer directors Kunling Wang and Olga uh, I'm sorry to say that my autocorrect has messed up her name. It starts with a C. I will, uh, you will find it in the program. I, I don't want to take the chance of saying it entirely wrong. I am also really happy actually to announce uh, that there's an addition to the program. Now you'll find it also on the program page. I think that the correct time is 7 a.m. on Monday morning, Swedish time. Yes, it's an absurd time, 7 a.m. However, that is Sunday if you're in the US or Australia, and that's, that's why it's been chosen. There's going to be a session about starting a global uh, collective or, uh, or an industry network for trans and non-binary um, professionals. So if you want to be on that call, check out the program on our website for details uh, on that. Thank you again to Scotty and Joey for their generosity with their time and thank you for watching. The next session will start at quarter past and then I will hand you over to Melissa. Thank you. <laughs>